good evening and welcome to Ren 11 Live today on Friday the 15th of May. I'm Sean Matthews and a very warm welcome to you all. As you're probably aware, in a few moments, I'm going to be interviewing the wonderful Busy Ezerioha of Busy Moto. And as you can probably imagine, I'm very excited. Guy is a legend when it comes to not just Porsche tuning, but also Honda tuning. Anyway, without much further ado, let's get the man of the hour in. Wave to everyone as well. Thank you for joining. Busy. Hello. How you Hello. doing? Fine. How are you, sir? I am fantastic, man. I've been. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my mobile office. It's called a 996, there you my go. friend. Very clever. Very nice. <laughs> well, ah, good you're seeing nice. you. It's good to see you too, man. As well, it's fantastic. I, I'll be honest, man. I am extremely excited to have you on this because, uh, well, you know, you you tune the two biggest passions of my life Porsches and Honda ah. there's a connection between both brands and it's it seems quite a common thing in the states as well well it wasn't initially when I started as far back as wow 2006 to do the first one yeah um in fact a lot of my peers told me not to do it but um I had to I had to by the way your beard is magnificent that thing's like <laughs> luscious and I can't, I can't get my beard like this it's pretty good <laughs> oh man if only. <laughs> do you know what i mean really uh, thank you very much it's it's basically cool. making up for the lack of hair on the bug ah. so uh it, it's dwindling down there but somehow i just have a, a miracle growth on the chin uh <laughs> thank you very much man but no um so um i suppose i'd like to kind of start with with your history how you you kind of got into the scene and the community whilst studying in university Yes. Doing, doing the naughty things that you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's correct. Um, many people may or may not know this, but I, I'm, I'm not from here in the U.S. I'm from West Africa. So I'm, I'm Nigerian mm -hmm. and uh, come from a family of scientists. Uh, my dad is this amazing geologist and my mom is a very talented biochemist. And growing up in this family, we always pushed towards the sciences. So I always had a knack for taking things apart and figuring things out. So I knew I'd do some kind of engineering and always had affinity for everything mechanical but mm. because my parents had a cosmetics factory and wanted me to follow in the footsteps of the family um i was asked to become a chemist as well but i guess being a chemical engineer was a good compromise yeah so i um, studying very hard and doing things very young and skipping quite a few grades i was able to enter university at the age of 15 back home um didn't learn anything because we just didn't have the technology Oh. So I begged my parents for me to come to the United States like they did, because they went to school here, and mm. they agreed. So um, in 1989, came here at the age of 16, and with two suitcases, my father was in <laughs> Europe on business, my mom was stayed back home to take care of the family, and I arrived at Los Angeles International Airport, where a family in the petroleum industry picked me up, who were uh, acquaintances to my father, and that's mm. how I came to America. Now... I've always loved cars. My parents tell me my first word as a child was cars. I've always been car crazy, but never had the ability to explore building or racing or you know doing anything fun with them. No. So coming here to the states, I had to buy my first car. So um, I know my friend Duran is over here. He's gonna make fun of me, but the first car that I wanted was something that was sleek. Aerodynamic, economical, but very attractive nonetheless. Eh? So I had two options I, I bought onto the Pontiac Fiero. <laughs> uh, it was it was Gina's favorite back then, though, wasn't it? It was you a know? looking car. Yeah. Or the MR2, the AW11 MR2. And I honestly, the MR2, I couldn't afford, and the Fiero had horrible reliability issues. So mm. that wasn't going to work. Hello, 7K graphics. <laughs> um, so that being said, um, I settled on a Honda CRX. Okay. So it's because interesting. It was, yeah, <laughs> Mid-engine we were looking was, at and then suddenly. It was, it was the closest thing that looked like a Fiero or a MR2 to some extent, but didn't have the power and wasn't as sleek, but it would do. So I opted, because of being a student, I opted for the high fuel efficiency model. Mm. So I had an 88 CRX HF, 
yeah. which had the roll-up windows and no AC and an aftermarket radio, and it's pretty slow. Had an eight-valve, 1.5-liter engine. This was a proper econo box. It really was. And mm. um, well, here's what happened. Um, what got me into the whole performance scene is I bought this car um, as a vehicle, just as a commuter, because I liked I liked the two-seater look, and it was cool, and it was miserly on gas, so I didn't have to go to petrol stations very often. So that being said. One day I got up to go to school, start the car, and I heard this, this do 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 emanating from the back of the car. I'm like, okay, it's weirdly intoxicating, but I don't think it's correct. I don't think it's right. So I need to find out what's going on. So I um, went to a local dealership, um, the dealership known as uh, Gardena Honda, and they quoted me $320, this $320 in the mid 90s to fix this muffler. And I am like, oh my God, that's a lot of money for a student. I couldn't afford it. So I had to do something else. So I asked a few people around the neighborhood where I lived, what I should do. They said, go to a local, go to a local muffler shop. So I did. And the muffler shop, oh, piece of cake. We can do this for like 80 bucks. Um, we'll put this Dynamax Ultra Flow straight through muffler in. And it's cheaper and I think you'll like it. So I sat down there. They cut the old one off, wadded it up, put it on. Make sure the tip was nice and straight. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, hop in. You're good to go. So I started the car up. Man, Sean, it was crazy. I started the car up and it made this, this, this beautiful sound. It was like this muffler. It was just and I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is great, right? And I back out and I go, I pay and drive off. And I'm like, wait a minute. I felt power. I felt an increase in power. And I said, what is what is this? This is, this is, what is this? What is this, 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 this magic? What is this, this witch, witchcraft? <laughs> so I had to learn. So that was my first experience with a muffler. So I went to a local bookstore, bought every book, you know, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the interwebs then, right? No, exactly. So for everything I can read, I'm buying domestic books on how to build horsepower. I'm buying the Honda Performance Handbook. I'm buying all these books just to read and understand what was going on. And I learned so much. And that was my quest um, to try and learn as much as I can. I went to local shops. Hey, I'm interested in getting something done, like a camshaft that I read in the book or this intake. And how can I do this? And a lot of people, what's interesting, and I talk about this a lot, a lot of people really shun me away. They're like, oh no, just drop the car off and we'll do it for you. But I want to understand the concepts and people just wouldn't help me or tell me. They just want me to drop the car and pay. But I really, I was fine with that, but I want to understand Hmm. how or why and the books were there but you can't ask books questions until i met this one gentleman his name is john Consiaudi. he had a company called advanced engine management in gardena um and he had a, it was a small shop performance shop and i went in there and said hey I, i'm here because i, I had this muffler it made more power i want to learn more i want to do more and he's an engineer as well and i was a student he said come on in I will tell you what you need to know, and I'll show you what I'm working on. And that was John Consiaudi, my mentor till today. He changed my life. He had me go back to that muffler shop, and a lot of people don't know this, or maybe they don't care to know this, but John Consiaudi was the father of the cold air intake. He had prototypes then, and he told me what to do. Go to a muffler shop, make this pipe, put this weird filter on the end of it, and you should net you some more power gains by removing restrictions in the intake. And I said, sure. And I, I did it to, to the T, to his instruction. And I got more power. It felt even more powerful. And I had another tone from the bonnet. And it was amazing. And, and that was it. I was, I was, I was bit. That was it. That was the beginning <laughs> of the end. From then on, I, was, I had to do everything I could to learn, to modify. Fast forward a year and a half from then, I had dual carbs on my setup. I have headers. I have a crazy valve train. So it was amazing. It was just, I was just... And that began the naughtiness you talked about, right? Mm. The racetrack. Bad, or, bad, man. So we called it a racetrack. <laughs> we're in the street racing. <laughs> yeah, we're in the street. Duran is here. What can I say? He's giving me the eye. Um, it was... <laughs> so I don't think you guys, I don't know what you guys have over there in the UK, but um, we had a, it's no longer exists. It's kind of defunct right now. There was a, a, a store, electronic store called Circuit City. And for those of you here in the U.S., you, you know what I'm talking about. That's where we service is state of the art. Yeah. Um, we, we had something so similar. There. Oh, there you go. I worked yeah. in Circuit City. And um, there was a Handy. gentleman who 
was a good friend of mine. We were hired the same day, and he had a Mazda with a 13B in it. And then in the back of the facility, in the installation of the car stereos, there was another gentleman with a Mazda 66, you know, Taryn. Yeah, so Taryn, and, and, and these guys, the guy with the Mazda was there to help me, like, hey, I'm, I love performance, but I'm not a, a, a track guy. But the guy in the rear would street race. So people in the facility were trying to set up a race with I and him in my CRX, with my intake and my exhaust, and his Mazda 626. And uh, 626 Turbo, by the way. Okay. And he, people hyped me up so much, he refused to race me for money. So we ended up going to a local drag strip, and we raced just for fun. Okay. Put you this way. Um, I'd never drag raced before, and he did a lot of street racing. Our first pass together, he ran 15-2 okay. to my 16-8. Do you know how that looks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a second's like a, an A. It's like from, <laughs> he's on his way back. And I'm still on the track trying to get to the end. <laughs> anyway, so I was so, like, except, most people would be devastated the first time out. But I was like, oh, my God, I want to learn. How's your car that fast? What did you do? What? He's like, oh, man, we go street racing. And, and that, he said street racing. I'm like, what is this concept? <laughs> what is that? And that was it. I, so imagine a world where I have school, I have work, and every dying moment I had to look for ways to improve my setup. And blowing stuff up, a lot of it, but learning and experiencing that as an experience opportunity. And not getting upset, but being happy that I broke something and finding ways to improve on it. And going faster and faster and faster. And then going to street races and making more money than I did working. <laughs> now, guys, I don't condone street racing at all. For all of you here, I'm not an advocate of that. It was very bad. I was a juvenile. I had no idea what I was doing. I was being very silly. And... I saw really bad things happen, and that's really why I stopped. But I, I, I can't escape the fact that I did participate in such behavior. I really did. <laughs> but, but that's the thing, though, isn't it? I mean, sometimes sticky situations can have a very positive effect on us in Absolutely. some shape way or form. And, and there you go. Absolutely. You know, you, you, you never got caught by the police. So uh, well done. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> the weird thing uh, is, what, the weird thing is, um, as Trevor even knows here, the some of the people, can I even say this? Some of the people who were racing with us were cops. Can you believe that? It was really yeah, a that. very hardcore scene back in the day and very respected and an admired scene until the movie came out. When uh... that movie came out, it killed everything. That was it. It was just people, it was, people who had no business going to street race started doing it, people being irresponsible, doing things on public roads, doing things near schools. It was just really... It got really bad. People getting hurt. Mm. Um, it, was just, it was just out of control. So that movie, as much as it helped the culture to some extent, it really, at least in the greater LA area, was very detrimental to the street racing scene. It really was. Yeah. I, I, we, we saw a similar thing. Don't get me, I, think, I think in the UK, we, back then, especially the import scene, we trailed by about five, six years when everything in 94, 95 was starting to kick off with fast Hondas. Nissans and, and stuff like this, we were more into our domestic vehicles. And about 2000, and then during the time of that movie that we're talking about, incidentally, I did an interview with RJ, as you know, a few weeks back. Yeah. And, uh, and, and because of that, the whole Japanese scene blew up. Everyone was running Velside or Velside style <laughs> body kits, Bomex, you know. And, and the scene became very how can i say there are a lot of people that were very heavy footed and they're standard we we have voxel courses here and they're yeah, yeah. For, for want of a better term dire um but you know they there were people asking about in cars being idiots causing trouble for the people that were there because of the a community aspect looking at cool cars hanging around with good friends maybe right. the odd you know speedy zone somewhere when no one's looking if you know what i mean um so but but again we had that problem as well and it had a, a massive negative effect and nowadays we don't right. really have much of a a scene like that we don't we don't do it so much not as a big scale as it used to be back in the north early to mid the uh, noughties and such so hmm. wilmington was a really hot spot made lots of money in wilmington compton was a very strong place to do race as well silmar which is a little bit on a little bit north of the greater LA area, 
And then Ontario, where I am now, was in an empire. Now, to answer that chap's question, Ontario is what made me stop racing because I saw someone actually pass away here. So Ugh. if you say it's where it's at, first of all, Ontario didn't have much money. <laughs> I have people here. <laughs> my good guy here. Gerardi helps me with a lot of tech stuff here. And he knows what I'm talking about. The big money was in Compton. Me yeah, Trevor knows Mansville out in Wilmington. Uh, Susanna. These are all streets. Forgive me, Sean. He's like, there's some hardcore LA guys here. They know what's going on, which is crazy. <laughs> only that, that, the, only awesome. the hardcore people knew Mansville. That's a street that only certain people knew. You, it, it was underground, total underground. No one really knew what that was. The average guy, even when the movie came out, people didn't know about Mansfield. But that was a place where I made five thousand dollars in one night as a as a teenager. So that was a, that was a, yeah that was. And this is nineties ninety five thousand, not today five thousand. Five. So that, was a, geez. that was a good one. You know, that was a good one. Yeah, Trevor knows what's up. Thank you, Trevor. You know, you know the deal. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, there seems to the, 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 the subculture of street racing then prior to let's say Fast and Furious we're kind of going off on a tangent I didn't expect we would be going um, <laughs> it sounds it sounds well, it's the nature of conversation isn't it yeah um, it is it's, uh, it, it sounds like there's a lot of interesting stories to be had but we never get information like this or it's oh. not as readily available so it sounds very much like you've got to be in amongst everything to have half an idea of what's going on absolutely 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 <laughs> I need it was, to, uh... it was crazy. And the good thing is that I had a good crew that I was around, a good team. And uh, they always protected the, the little African boy, which is good. Because Matrix, I had this really was fast it? car, but I, I was, yeah, there you go. But I wasn't very, um, I wasn't aware of the, of, the ways of the ways of the world in LA, in, in, in South Central or, or East LA or West LA. I just didn't know. So if, if someone didn't want to pay, for example, uh, my teammates would tell me to go ahead and, oh, go ahead, BC leave. And I don't know what happens, but they get the money. We, I end up getting the money. So, but I never was there to <laughs> witness what happened, what transpired. Because I was oh, really, man. you know, the student, you know, but my car was really freaking fast after some time. I was just really dedicated in making that fast. And that, took, that mindset of creating, of figuring things out, of testing and exploring is what pushes me to today, even in the European scene. It continues to push me to do things. Uh, I'm breaking things as recently as Friday. I'm still breaking things and figuring things out. And it's great. And I learn from that, improve, and make things better. Ju oh, my goodness. I can't believe it. Okay. You see this gentleman here who just came in? One grande, Juan grande to you. To you. Yeah. He, this guy, you know what? He needs to fess up today. So that's Big John. Big John is here. That is John. John is the person who protected me at the street races years ago. And get it, it gets better. You know that $5,000 I won? Go on. I didn't have $5,000 as a student. John had $5,000 in his pocket, gave me the money. And if I won, just give it back to him. If I lose, it's okay. Never met me in his life. He was my peer walking around Compton with $5,000 cash in his pocket. John, what did you do for a living? <laughs> no, 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 don't tell you, ask me now. This, this, can't, this is going to go on YouTube. Don't, don't do that to the guy. There you go. See, he's safe, man. That's it. I don't want to get involved in this shit. Can you imagine? Uh, why, why is the FBI oh come onto my, um, I my, can't onto my food? John really, I mean, really, John was, he was there from day one. John was the main guy who would tell me to leave. We'll get the money. Just, just go ahead, leave. And he'll come back. Here's your money. I don't know what he did, him and Taryn. I don't know what they did to get the money. But they got Ask it. no questions, tell no pay. lies. <laughs> <laughs> Man, oh that's... my God, this is amazing. I couldn't have made this up. This is amazing. But see, John, there you go. Awesome, dude. We had we had good times then. People are you saying don't answer. <laughs> exactly, just don't answer, man. Um, I think um, it, it's interesting, though, isn't it? It seems that yeah. you kind of infected the people around you with <laughs> enough trust in your ability for them to go. Yeah, fine. Here's the money. Just do it. What yes, do you think? I, I don't. It was so weird because um, the person I had to race that day, Tom Young, who I raced that day. He just put that number out there and said, $5,000. And I'm like, I'm an African, African student. I've never even seen $5,000 before. <laughs> I even? And then this guy comes up to me and says, hey, man, hey, bro, here, I, I got it. Just, just. I'm like, no, no. He's like, no, no, don't worry. If, if, if you lose, then no big deal. And then when I won, he allowed me to keep the winnings, which is even crazier, you know? So it's like, 
John's my brother. He was there for me. And he ended up being my crew chief as he became semi-pro, traveling around the country, doing a lot of racing. It was great. Yeah. It was fantastic, you know? That is incredible. Uh, what do you think it is about you that makes people just want to support you? Because, okay, let's look at some stats here. And I know we shouldn't get, um, like, look too deeply into things. But, you know, your Instagram has got over 220,000 followers. Whenever you're online you say hello to everyone, your warmth, your natural warmth and empathetic nature is, is very clear to see. Um, but you know, what is it, what is it that about busy that people just, just want to hug you? Like I, I want to hug you right now. But I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just, I just, no man is an Island and no matter what we achieve here, it's not just me. It, it's not. Um, it's a community, whether it's online where we have, you know, these, these dozens of people interacting with us here, um, we couldn't do this without them. Um, mm. Even as you and I are talking, Duran is here. He helps me tremendously with a lot of technology here in the shop, building and having things and making sure that things are done safe. When I'm out of the track and my customers are safe. Up front, I have an entire team, even though it's got to crew because of COVID, we're still making things happen. Um, when I race around the country, breaking <laughs> records and winning events, John was there traveling, leaving his family. Going to Florida, John, John, dude, I don't even remember when we had to pull a transmission in North Carolina in 80% humidity to make the finals. We won the race, but it was only him and I, skeleton crew, changing a gearbox in the pits before the next round. So it's like, it's just, I, I love people and I, I'm, I'm there to embrace and I'm there to be there and just, it's just me being me. Mm. So, um, and I see so much support here from Import Works and Louis and <laughs> Look at Louis. Graphics and it's just, you know, it's, it's fantastic. So I really don't know, but I'm just being who I am. And cool, uh, with that, I'm fortunate to have a great team around me to support me. Do you feel that could be something that people should be more like themselves? Yes, rather? Yes. There, there seems to be a lot of falseness on the internet. And that don't get correct. me wrong. You look on the internet, you look at Instagram, especially on pers a person's personal page, and it's a snapshot of something that may not necessarily be reality. Should people be more like themselves and be happy with what they've yes, got? Yes, there's, there's no fear. And you know what? Um, yeah, it, it gets me in trouble sometimes. My team make fun of me, like, tell me not to say many jokes because I'm not good at jokes. <laughs> so I try to stay, but it's just me. Um, I think out of the box, and by thinking out of the box and creating different projects and things that are not typical, creates a lot of scrutiny from the mm. media, from peers, from other racers. Um, even when I drag race, and John here can attest to that, I was the most protested drag racer in our scene. Literally, even though I did things differently that most people understand. And if you ask me, I would tell you, I never hide my technology. I, I put it out there knowing that next month I would know more. It continues to evolve. So I have no problem sharing what I know. But then no, no. I had a lot of people who would just attack and attack. And despite that, I'm still my, it's just me. I will still keep doing it. I will still, I will not conform because people attack it. Because you know what happens after they attack? They copy. They, they copy. attack it, and then they copy. Yeah, they copy. Happening now. So um, it's, 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 I'm used to it. I'm used to it. Oh, Louis is asking, when am I going to visit Jay Leno's garage again? We're supposed to before COVID. And that Thursday, when LA was locked down, or California was locked down, we were our shooting was canceled. So once this lifts up, I'm sure Jay would be more than happy to drive another one of our cars. He, he loves our work. He loves our work indeed, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, man, that would be, uh, I, I think that's, that's another amazing thing. You know, you messing around with a 1.5 CRX <laughs> has got you into the position where you make shit hot cars, uh, talk with shit hot people, and you've been interviewed by Jay Leno. I mean, what the, I, I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna swear, you know, I need to stop that. Fuck me, man. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you know what I mean? He's a good guy. He's, of all the people I've met, really honestly, in Hollywood, he is the most knowledgeable when it comes to vehicles. He knows mm -hmm. more about cars than some shop owners I know, which is scary. He knows oh. the stuff. And one thing he loves about us is that, once again, with the scrutiny thing, we build cars. People say, oh, it can't be that power. It can't be this. Jay can drive your car and say, oh, this is about, this is about 650. He knows. It's weird. It's uncanny. And he knows and he loves us because he says, you guys bring what you bring and you bring what you say it is, which is great. So he said he would drive a bicycle if we built it. So he's, he's really good. He's really good. <laughs> well, that's, he's that's, 
that's testament to your work brother you know that's good man. that's good um <laughs> this kind of works into a great segue because let's talk <laughs> about something that everyone seems to hate it's not one of, i'm not i'm yeah. not one of them electrification ah yeah <laughs> when, when we take an no, engine I... that goes and make it go actually go <laughs> <laughs> the um it's weird um i was anti-electric mm. for a very long time um diehard petrol head once again i came from a world of small displacement high rpm engines and then i went to force induction and was widely received with that and then behind me see quite a few um european offerings one on the, on the left and a couple down here and believe it or not a honda customer is who got me into porsches one of my clients Benny Pequa, he is um, a Honda Challenge racer, um, a French millionaire, retired, and but his first car was also a CRX, so he um. never left that, never left that, left that love of, of Hondas. So he would road race CRXs and Civics, but his daily was a Porsche 911. And he said, "BC, this crazy stuff you're doing, have you considered getting into Porsches?" I'm like, "Well, I don't know anything about those. I have a poster on my wall at home when I was growing up, but..." never had the opportunity to play with it. He said, the scene needs new blood. It's all these older tuners. You should probably get into it. So um, I said, sure. So in normal BC fashion, um, <laughs> I built that blue, the first blue with the twin turbos. Oh, like, oh that, that thing. Roller. That's the first Porsche I ever built. Proper. And I bought this roller from San Diego. Yeah. And I made a name in the Honda world building single cam engines. And initially it was purely due to austerity. I just couldn't afford um, to do a B series swap, which was pretty hot at the time, let mm -hmm. on the H series, I could afford it. But then, with the attention I got from the media, we're building this awkward car that did very well and won some races. When I started making money, I said, Hey, I need to take this recipe further. So I stayed with a larger single cam engine, the F22 from the Accord. So mm -hmm. I noticed that if there's one way that you want to create awareness for a business or for your partners, is to get people to pay attention. So here I am. Great advice from my client. I buy a roller Porsche. What could I do to get attention from the Porsche community that a new tuner is in town? I know. Let me use an engine that they absolutely hate. That people say that there's <laughs> no kind of aftermarket capability that's just a ticking time bomb. What engine? The oh. M96 engine. Out of what, the, the one in the back of this? 96. There you go. Oh, my God. So... <laughs> I took that engine, an expired one, by the way, addressed all the shortcomings, the intermediate shaft issues, mm -hmm. the de-chunking of the sleeves, um, oiling issues. I addressed all the valve train, where sometimes the springs break, and I addressed all those issues, like we do in the Honda world, right? Mm -hmm. First time I built that car, I built it, <laughs> once again, in the whole Honda scene. See, someone says 1.5 Civic Wagon was like 800 wheel horsepower, LOL. Actually, that was a 1.6 that was 725, 726 horsepower to the wheels. And I used that same mindset, making things big on that blue Porsche. So I put twin 67 millimeter turbos on this Porsche. It shut down my dyno, and my dyno <laughs> read up to 1100. Red screen, shut it down. Side street right here at the facility, I went to test it. First gear, second gear, then third gear, floored it, and nothing was happening. <laughs> it's just, uh, what? Then all of a sudden, front end came up. <laughs> the boost hit so hard, I let off. The car slammed on the ground. Right, I was. Ter I pulled back into the shop. It was a Saturday. No one was here. Cooled down. My legs were shaking when I got the car. The car cooled down. I pulled the turbos off. It was too big. So I went down to sixty-one, sixty-two turbos, turbonetics. And then finally, third generation went down to 57 millimeters, which is perfect. And the 57 is what everyone drives. I left that 850 wheel. Um, that's what Matt Farad drove. And like, this shouldn't be on the street. It shouldn't be on the main road. Uh, Spike Ferenson from uh, um, uh, Car Matchmaker drove it. Like, this is ridiculous. This is, shouldn't be legal. Jay Leto mm -hmm. drove it, almost killed both of us. But it was really <laughs> great. But that got me into it. Now, so it's fine. You know? Here's the thing. Why am I telling this long, verbose story? Um, well, first, it's my, it's my journey from the Honda world into the Porsche world. It was really a client. And by the way, a lot of my partners, I had a partner at Falcon. Falcon was one of my tire sponsors then, who mm -hmm. told me not to do it. I'll never be accepted. Um, one of my good 
good friends from a big electronics company uh, also said the same thing to me. Don't, you don't know what you're doing. It's different from, from Honda. Leave it alone. Pay someone to build the car. Deaf ears. I did it myself. That first mm -hmm. engine is still in the chassis over there running since 2007. And I've given the keys to the media. That's one thing about me. If you came here, I give the keys to you. Drive it. Beat up on it. That's me. So mm -hmm. I'm very... My cars are built to be driven. They're not just display show pieces. So why, why am I telling this story once again? I, I'm getting to that. Um, I always experienced a level of guilt that's always been there. Guilt okay. being, as a chemical engineer now, I understand what hydrocarbons can do to us. I understand what it does mm. to our environment. Um, mm -hmm. So in my, unbeknownst to a lot of people, the reason why a lot of my cars are now flex fuel or ethanol based for propulsion, or ethanol, yeah. it, it was because of my, it's my way of trying to make things performance but cleaner. Mm -hmm. So that being said, that was my way of patting myself and like, okay, BC, it's okay. Shoot flames, have fun, drive these turbo cars, uh, drive these high compression NA setups, but use a fuel that's more friendlier to the environment. Mm -hmm. Then in 2010, American Honda, one of my partners from racing, because mm -hmm. uh, I was semi-pro at the time, American Honda took me under the belt, they were paying me for winning races. They said, hey, we have a concept. We have this new CRX, because we know you love CRXs that's going to come out and we want you to build it for us for our SEMA show. I'm like, wow, that's the, that's the ultimate goal for any shop. I was just taken aback. And I said, sure, I have the best idea. I know what to do. I'm going to take that 1.5 liter hybrid engine, throw it in the refuse bin, and then put a K-series in there. And but that didn't happen, told, did it? I was told, do not do it. Absolutely not. <laughs> and I'm glad they didn't. Because it, it opened my eyes to the benefits of the Axio electric motor which is an integrated motor assist. It exists between the gearbox and the petrol engine. And, the and engine it acts is. as a generator and absorption unit. So you can use it as a starter. You can use it as a generator to charge the batteries. And you can use it as a, as a, a unit to discharge energy to help propel you forward. Mm -hmm. And if done properly, you can have impeccable bottom end and a nice turbocharger up top and do what we did, which is 533 horsepower. And it was an amazing transmission-destroying machine. So it was great. <laughs> and that was my first taste. I'm like, hmm, there's something here. But I still wasn't sold. I subscribed to the church of electric cars have no soul. Electric cars are abominations. Electric mm -hmm. cars are for tree huggers. That was and not that I experienced it, but I heard it from people and I absorbed that. So that was my mindset, you know? Yes, Louis, I'm a chemical engineer. Absolutely. So that being said... <laughs> Acura. See, there's an NSX right here next to me. Yeah, I see the Acura, NSX, the orange one. One of our partners, very naughty people, started sending NSXs for me to evaluate, right? Ah. Uh. And I'm like, this is pretty cool. V6 petrol engine, twin turbo, three electric motors. Huh, I wonder how this would do at the drag strip. So, first I go to road race track, it's amazing. Go to drag strip. I'm spanking cars with more than 40% the power. Because the launch was explosive, immediate torque. It was just gapping people at the raceway. So I'm going to the local 8th mile drag strip at Irwindale. I have one. My wife has one. She's spanking Hellcats. She's spanking Novas. She's spanking WRXs that make 800 horsepower on street tires in full trim with AC. So it's like, <laughs> wait a minute. Now, if this was a quarter mile, those races would have been a little more interesting. Hmm. But in the eighth mile, she was destroying these guys. Hmm. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's, some, there's something going on here. So I said, huh, I should probably build an electric one and just, or, or, or a hybrid, a performance hybrid, and see what happens. Then one of our partners, Harmon Carden, invited us to the CES, Computer Electronics Show in Vegas. Okay. So I yeah. go there. Had no clue that my partners were there. My partners being Ford, American Honda, Hyundai. That is always a SEMA that we build cars for, for SEMA. Mm -hmm. I go to CES. Sean, they have booths that are bigger, better, and more impressive than anything we've done at SEMA ever. They're investing more into EV technology than they do into our petrol cars for their shows. And I saw okay, yeah. something's going on here. And they have complete departments dealing with mobility solutions for the future. And that mm. really piqued my interest. So I said, you know what? Okay, 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 okay. I need to build something soon. 
Now, this project behind me was supposed to be a petrol-based car. I've never shared this with anyone, but I'm sharing with you and your, and your team here. That uh. car is supposed to be a petrol-based car. But one of my Thank partners you. that's supposed to help with this build, um, the manager who was spearheading the project got in trouble and was excused from the organization. So because the partner that's supposed to build this with us no longer had this as a project to build, I was stuck with a car that was halfway done because I put a lot of money into it already to get it done on time for SEMA. You know how SEMA is, last minute scramble. Yeah, I do that. Yeah. And I said, oh my God, we have this project halfway done. I invested tens of thousands of dollars in this chassis. What can I do now? And my wife suggested, great girl, she suggested that EV thing. Why don't you do it on this? I'm like, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> and it's just so happened yeah. the week we were discussing this. I went to the PECLA, the Porsche Experience Center in LA, in Carson, and I saw an electric 912, and I spoke to the owner, and he was just so taken aback by it. Then I went to the Hoonigan event, and I saw Michael from EV West with his BMW, and he was doing donuts, more burnouts than any petrol car that was there. And any LS Twin Turbo, his burnout was quiet, but just the car disappeared and smoked. And I said, that's Talk, it. I'm the only one. That's it. Talk. That's it. That's it. And then this came to be. And in normal fashion, I wanted something that was exciting, that would catch people's attention, that can talk about the performance market. And, and I, I went from this time last year, I knew very little to now I have clients. I can design components like crazy for this. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to tell you and, and everyone here listening that this car has changed my life. It is the fastest thing I've ever driven and it's legal in California because you have no emissions. <laughs> California is a ridiculous state when it comes to emissions. It's an 84. So in California, if I have to do something like this, it has to be a pre-75 vehicle where I can do my turbos or something. It's illegal to have it any other way. But this is an 84 that's faster. My 0 to 60 I clocked, and I'm rolling into it with the throttle, was 2.06. In this thing, rolling, and I'm throwing in it because if I stomp it, it just blows the tires away. It's just me. So I, I need to put a logic for traction control in this thing, or the, a better traction control logic and a better launch control logic in it, and mm. it'll be really. I can get sub twos, and it's anyone who drives it. Put it this way: I've had people from the UK, diehard petrol heads, come here and say, "Oh, I'll, I'll shoot the car, but I have no interest." Uh, I'm like, "Could you just drive it?" Just drive. Because <laughs> once again, BC, right? Here's the key. Go drive. One gentleman came back and got on his knees and said, shut up and take my money. Like, <laughs> die hard. He would pay a congestion charge to go to London yep. for a cup of coffee. He would pay the congestion charge, then have a hybrid or EV to skip that. He would pay any freaking fee so that he doesn't drive an electric car until he drove that. And he's like, if this is how performance EVs are, sign me up. So it really, it really is amazing. It's, it it's is. changed. And the tuning window, and you know what? I'm very lucky. Forgive me, I get really excited about this. I'm very lucky because this car came out for SEMA last year in the Toyo booth, almost the same time that Porsche launched the Taycan. So I had my flame suit ready, and it just so happened Porsche came out with theirs, so it wasn't as bad. So I'm not getting a lot of <laughs> negative feedback from the community, from purists. Okay, I got occasional. I had two death threats and a couple guys. I heard about those. Sacrilege, you I know, heard about but, those. Um, <laughs> overall, people say, you know, I, I don't get it, but it's pretty cool, you know. And Louis, you're right. I can talk cars forever. I really can. I really can. I love cars. So it's, you know, it's really different. And um, I, I welcome when you come here to please come by, drive it around, see how you like it. When you sit in the car, it looks and feels like a classic 911. And mm. you've driven a few classics. When you sit inside, it smells, it looks, it feels like a classic 911. But when you hit the throttle just a third, oh my God, it's the most, it's like a, you feel your chest. It's like, it's just, oh my God, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. So, so with your 935, um, what, is it a twin motor? or quad motor great question it's a single motor um someone asked ah. this question before is it like a tesla it's very similar to architecture but what you may see in a tesla with a single motor on one side a built-in mm -hmm. inverter on the other side and stator with an integrated okay. transaxle um unlike most Teslas out there that would rev to fifteen thousand rpms this goes to 18.2 
Um, most drive units of that similar size would do maybe 400 kilowatts. Um, I have 475 kilowatts of energy, which is about 636 horsepower. Yep. Um, the controller is bespoke. So um, one thing that, um, as I looked into the EV space, that made me a little bit uncomfortable was that my peer engineers would build cars where you have multiple switches to turn everything on. You turn on the main uh, power switch and then the po po negative contactor and positive contactor, pre-charge, the positive contactor. And they do all this just to get the car running. And I'm like, uh, no. Or some other people have a screen, which is very not, it doesn't look very motorsports or very enthusiast-like to have a mm. screen that you're changing and change settings to start it up. And this car, as an engineer, I have this very unique power distribution model module from drag racing that does everything for you. So when you get in the car, John, and you put the key in ignition, you turn it to number two position, everything starts up and you just shift forward for the gear and you move. You don't have to press buttons, switches, screens. It's very enthusiast centric is what this car is. So that being said, um, I built it like what you and I would build if all we did was try and do a conversion or electrify a classic vehicle, something that an enthusiast could appreciate. When automotive brands like Audi and Porsche uh, are, are doing that and you have people like yourself who are going, why not? You know, let's yes. do this. Let's make it into an electric car. It's only going to be more positive for everyone in the long run because people are going to be like, yeah, it's actually a viable option for me. I, I, I'm, yeah. I have to think about this. My 996, it's my car for life. <laughs> I, nice. There, but there will come a time where I may yes. not be allowed to drive it unless I have to it's get rid true. of the M96. Very and it will true. be painful, but I love the car too much to just have it as an ornament. Does that make sense? Uh, of course. Absolutely. And, well, there's and an opportunity I, for you to electrify that. that. That can happen. I don't know how the laws are in the UK for you guys, but um, it's, it's really a great thing to do. It's, it's almost, dare I say, and I may be reaching out saying this, reaching a little far, it's almost more how should I say, from a societal perspective, more responsible to repurpose a car than to build one. So if you think of the energy required to build a brand new car or to repurpose an older one, it may be more socially responsible to repurpose than to build one from scratch, of just course, from an yeah. energy perspective, you know? So your 96 could have a second life. <laughs> and more exactly. Enjoyable life, you know? uh, yeah, exactly. You know, as a, as a table ornament where the rest of the car gets shifting. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Some, uh, this gentleman here, M5 V, oh, okay, M5 V10. I should have guessed that. Wicked car, man. Hopefully you've got one. <laughs> uh, he says, "Don't you miss the sound, the vibration, the resonance, and the mechanical parts moving with combustion?" Great well, okay. question. What are your it thoughts is. on that? What are your thoughts? Because I can answer that easily. Uh, do you know what? I will miss that. I will. But I'd rather hold on to present thoughts and think about memories of driving something. I would rather be able to go out in my car and have that that feeling of freedom um then then just languish thinking god you know what i really missed the sound of that flat six uh, and also at the same time it it changes your perception of driving it changes what you can do everyone is so used to like oh i've got to really work okay honda people very used to working hard the engine yeah. to ensure you move that, that, that low torque high revving they right. sound amazing vtec's an awesome awesome thing um you know, and, and, and it's all well and good. And even turbos, low power, it's nice. But you still have that minimal amount of lag. You know, you have Audi making electric turbochargers to minimalize right. that on diesel engines, like right. on the S5, S4, and the other, the other. But instant torque, it's, it's, um, you have to experience <laughs> it to understand that sort of like, okay, I'm just going to, oh, Jesus, you know, it's, it's great. Do you know what I mean? Um, your answer, though. Well, that's for me, it's, like, it's like music. Everyone has different tastes. And I thought the same thing as well until I built my own. It's not quiet. As a matter of fact, I, not thinking ahead, if you look at the rear of the vehicle, I have an aperture between the motor compartment and the cabin that's completely open. So you hear everything. It pumps into the cabin with you. It's, a different, it's not quiet completely. It's a different sound. Even on my YouTube mm. page, you can see me driving around town. And you can hear it. It's this mechanical weird that almost is jetson like and it's pretty freaking cool yeah it's really cool <laughs> so it's not devoid and then you know what's weird you talk about connection and mechanical i hear the stones i hear the suspension i feel it's it's almost more you may think i'm crazy i'm connected more to the road because i hear everything 
Now the motor was almost dampening that feeling and sound. And don't get me wrong, I love the wear of a supercharger. I love the the nice that that air that air rushing noise of a turbocharger. There's a turbo. This thing sounds. This 935 factory behind me sounds amazing. But there's something where you and I, Sean, can sit in this car and have a conversation. But it still has this mechanical wear. You look down like, oh shoot, I'm 110 miles an hour. Let me let off <laughs> because you're used to hearing an engine rev up. Yeah. And, and that kind of almost gives you a, a subconscious gauge of how fast you're going. With this, it's not as crazy. And you look down like, oh, shoot, I'm going to be let off. It's just, it's different and not bad. And there is sound and there is soul. And there's another element to that as well, thinking about it. It's cost because there's less moving parts in an electric motor comparative Absolutely. to a combustion engine. You have an, a, an internal combustion engine is... Uh, the, the amount of parts wow. in it is exhaustive. The springs, uh, the valves, yeah. Uh, yeah. everything moving into it. Repairs, you know, clips, and ex bearings. Exactly, bolts. exactly. All yeah. held together wow. with, with gaskets and bolts and oil thrown into it. And yeah, voila, it's great. It sounds amazing, but if it goes wrong, oh shit. You know, yeah. yeah See, with an Louis, electric motor. Louis saying something very interesting here about um, it should have a five speed gearbox. So someone else said it has a gearbox on mine now. I don't know if people really understand why the gearbox even exists, <laughs> you know, in a petrol Go. engine. It's primarily because of the nature of how the torque is delivered. Petrol engines have a very narrow efficiency band. So what that means is your peak torque where the car is most efficient is very narrow. Mm. So to be able to spend time in that power band so you don't stall the car or have an enjoyable experience, you need a gearbox to multiply torque to keep you there as your speed increases. Well, guess what? With 90 plus percent efficiency and a pretty wide torque curve, you have no need to shift. Now, I have a logic I've developed, which I'm going to put into the next car I build, that if you want to have that feeling sensation, I'll be more than happy to, with a shift, reduce torque and bring it back to you, if that's what you want to feel. Because that's essentially <laughs> what's happening mechanically. Yeah. So, yes, when I build you an electric vehicle, Louis, I can give you a torque reduction lever and then you, as you go up, you can shift and you feel like you're shifting, but you don't need to have that. It's faster and a lot more efficient and you don't lose time when you're shifting. And petrol engines need it because of the nature of the power delivery. But that's interesting because haven't Porsche and Rimac both got a two-speed, for want of a gearbox, but isn't that for launching purposes? You have a, a lower... Absolutely. Uh, it, it, because otherwise right. you would just be spinning around and you won't that's go anywhere. Right. But it would look spectacular like Absolutely. So, so depending on how much you spend, Louis, brother, you can get two speeds now <laughs> yes. uh, and, and reverse on top of it as well. So, of right. course. And Louis, I'm not crying. I'm being 100% with you. I'm, so I have customers. <laughs> I have a client in line. And that's why that logic, I, I, it has no use. I have no use for it. But I have a customer in line who wants it. And I'm going to put that logic into his controller where he can shift and it will literally, for a fraction of a sec second, reduce torque and bring it back. And he's shifting. And you have a sound difference from that. You have that, that feel of, you know, that mechanical feel. I, I can, it's no problem. But you don't need it with this type of setup. Uh, as long as you don't start sticking engine sounds on top of the... No. Yeah, thank you. I am Good. against that. Um, probably, the, the worst thing I would do is amplify the natural sound. So mm. um, let's say I have a car with a lot of sound deadening. You don't want to hear the stones and chips hitting. You can sound dead in a car. But if you want to have that, that feel, I can... Harman Kardon has this technology they want to expose us to that allows us to amplify sounds. I'm about amplification, but I'm not about artificial yeah. <laughs> creation. Of, I don't want it to sound like an anti-lag or a V8 or a Rotary <laughs> or you know, any of that stuff, you know? Yeah, not like Tesla did with their uh, Roadster originally. I remember the Brabus one. This was about 11 years ago, and you could get a Brabus one, and you could choose, do you want a, a four-pot? Do you want a, a V6 or do you want wow. a, a really high revving V8 sound coming from the back? And this was a Goodwood. And I remember standing next to it and just thinking, no way. Joke. Yeah. But yeah, but this was oh available. And it was a Brabus tuned Tesla. And, you and know even what? this year. I can year, see that. Uh, I can see that uh, work. I can see consumers wanting that. But for uh, you and I, all the uh, hardcore uh, enthusiasts, it's, it's no. fake. It's fake. You know, that even this year, funny enough, I was at, uh, there's a, a a big event in January in the UK called Auto Sport International. And yes, at, uh, Mil 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 at yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. Correct. Um, and they had, Miltech had a stand and they had a Tesla Model 3. Mm. Wow. The tuner yeah. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. As in, who makes exhausts? So interesting. Uh, I, I needed to do more research on this, but I remember you just reminded me. I was thinking to myself, why? Why is there a Tesla Model Three at a Miltech stand? Ah. what's going on? Yeah, exactly. So, um, ah. again, maybe like you say, it's a consumer thing. It maybe makes them feel at peace. Yes, <laughs> you know. But but the benefit of electric car, especially if we dislike someone, is they're not going to hear you when you creep up and take them out. So benefit. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen, you know, because I'm I'm in trouble. It's now committed onto uh, onto video. So, um, what we're going to do? Let's see if we've got some questions from yes. from people. Uh, Oh, here we go. So, Mackay the DJ, there is an aftermarket exhaust sound mod for the Tesla Model 3. Oh, okay. my goodness. Okay. Not my yeah. company. <laughs> no, no, it's, it, it's fake, isn't it? It's like um, when people used to put a spark plug in their exhaust to get flames out of their... There you go. Uh, yes, that's yeah. correct. Um, correct. Oh, here we go. I work on trains, and they technically have a three-speed. Okay. Uh, I guess electric trains, you know, so that's interesting <laughs> to know that. There was a question further up. Let's see if there's anything. I think most of it was geared towards your um, street racing lifestyle. Oh, <laughs> but I see that <laughs> M um, MFIV V10 says that we should connect more often. I guess you and I have good chemistry, Sean. We have good chemistry, so they want to connect more often, you know? <laughs> okay uh, maybe i just I, I i laugh an awful lot man that's my problem I, I don't really say much i just laugh um well wistful wistful philosopher has had a good one he said if performance evs are the future what would you suggest would be the mod tech developments in the future or is that trade secrets no it's not a trade secret the tuning capabilities are this wide i mean fail safes are extremely important and that's going to be one huge component of evs and ev conversions in the performance arena mm. But definitely the way that torque is delivered, so you can make a car, maybe I can set up the controller in this to mimic a real 935 petrol engine, where it's sort of low torque, goes up to high torque and falls off again. Um, you have the capability of doing launch control, like I mentioned earlier on. You can have different modes. I have my own ludicrous mode in this, which is my BC mode, which is pretty crazy. You can <laughs> BC <that> mode. <laughs> um, you can do wheel-to-wheel -wheel, um, speed sensor uh, logic to allow you for impeccable traction control. You can do very clever things with four motor setups, which I plan on doing some stuff with um, our friends from Karma very soon. What I mean by that is you can have control logic for each four motors and each wheel, and you can do some very clever things with vectoring on the track. You could crab walk a car into a parking structure. You can do front burnouts, rear burnouts. You can twist a car around in one circle. There's so many things you can do, and that's all that's tuning. So the tuning capabilities are not a secret. They're very vast and very capable with EVs. And then once again, for the design people, it is a renaissance. You no longer have to worry about valve covers, head heights. Um, exactly. it, it's, just, it's just they have this blank sheet to start off with now. Which is Lower amazing. center of gravity as well, yeah, absolutely. when you consider that. I mean, as, as an engineering point of view, having all your batteries down the middle of the vehicle, if, if you can, you know, underneath, it, it makes everything the weight or the bottom. That's absolutely. why everyone's saying such amazing things about the Taycan. You know, they're saying right. it drives like a 911. It's like, right. well, yeah, of course. Oh, Alan said the same thing, DPW photography. We need more Ren 11 and BC Live videos. Okay, Sean, we have to give the people what they want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is this the start of something beautiful, man? <laughs> Maybe it is, sir. Maybe it is. Because I have a um, feeling we didn't get to half the stuff we want to talk about. I have a feeling about that. I'll tell you what. <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this question, and I shouldn't probably ask it while we're live, but perfect it. Shall we do a part two where we can go into more detail and maybe have a look around Busy Moto? That'd be good. Yeah, that'd be let's, good. Let's put that in for the future, man. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds like a plan to Done. Uh, and anyway, now I've actually pinned you to say that. So there you go. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, Busy, I just want to say thank you so much for tonight, thank man. You. <laughs> you are an absolute legend. And it's great to see more decent, warm, uh, empathetic people that are in the community willing to help out the community. So thank you so much, appreciate man. I really appreciate thank it. You. No worries. No worries. No worries, man. Take you care. Take care. Stay safe. All Cheers. the best. Take care. Bye -bye.